Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar hosted by the Gordon Institute of Business Science. This is a webinar on the topic of what keeps CFOs up at night, or oh, it's rather you know, strategies for success from the CFOs who have joined us this afternoon. My name is Casey Rotok Chesaina. I've written the book, Master's Money. It is a book on the strategies for success from the CFOs of South Africa's biggest companies. So this book is available at your local bookstore, exclusive books, bargain books, and so on. It's also available to order online at takealot.com, loot.co.za, Amazon, you name it. This afternoon, uh, we are fortunate to be joined by a couple of my interviewees who I will gladly introduce. Maybe we'll go ladies first and start with Grathol Motau. Grathol is the CFO of Tebe Investments. She has a long CV. I'll just give a couple of highlights. She's been a, a partner of one, one of the big four firms She's also worked at the IDC. She's been in the public sector at the National Treasury. Uh, and she's worked for Mabubesi and Blue IQ. And other than her formal role, she was also executive coach. And she has been a commentator in the media. You may have seen her on TV or heard from her on radio. She is also media commentator on finance and economic matters. Also joining us this afternoon is Glenn Fullerton, who is the CFO of Nampak Limited, a listed entity on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. This is Africa's largest packaging group. And prior to that, Glenn was working for a few entities, a number of entities, IT sector, he also worked at SA Druggist, which is currently um, Aspen, or rather it mutated to Aspen over time. And he also worked at Collar Packaging and so on. So a very uh, flowerful career that Glenn has had. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you, Grathol, for joining the discussion. Thank you, Kasi. Thanks. So uh, I think we will just have a discussion on strategies for success and we'll also fill in the participants who've joined this afternoon on the kind of role that you are playing as financial directors, uh, the kind of issues and challenges that you're experiencing, perhaps also give us some commentary on your thoughts on what is going on currently uh, in, in, in market, in, in the post-pandemic era and so on. Let me start with you, Glenn. And uh, Glenn, your, your conversation, or rather when I wrote your chapter, I titled it, the man who doctors said will never work again. Perhaps just for the benefit of the hundred odd people who've joined us this afternoon, you can tell them why doctors said you would never work again and how you managed to get back to working and to be in the C-suite of Nampak Limited. Thank you, Kasi. Um, you know, it was a, morning that I woke up to <clears throat> being a cyclist in February 2013, along with some friends, I went out to, to ride a, a race called the Ride for Sight, which is a preparatory race for the Argus. And I've completed 23 Arguses now, but in this particular incident, we had done 106 kilometers in three hours. And there was an unfortunate incident with the car that ended up uh, causing a horrific accident. I was four bikes back in the peloton and went head first into the tart, 45 to 50 kilometers an hour, injuring myself very, very badly. Um, I broke the AC joint to my shoulder. I broke several ribs. I had three prolapse discs in my neck and I had something called vertical shearing in my brain, which, you know, having hit the tart that, that speed, even though one had a helmet on, uh, it caused a, a kind of, um, sharing of your neural pathways in the right hand side of, your, of my brain which caused um, <clears throat> short-term memory issues for me and certain cognitive difficulties and the the specialist said that you know given the accident i'd never be able to work again 
because of the extent of the injuries. And now being in a very determined individual, I refused to accept that lot in life. I was only 45 years old at the time. And, you know, I think the lessons I've learned from that, you can never, ever take your health for granted. And your life can change in an absolute instant. And often, being finance people, we, we think of our material assets on our balance sheets. But really, the lesson for me is your, your most valuable asset is actually your health. And um, when that suddenly gets taken from you in an instant, and clearly an unplanned one, um, you really focus on life quite differently. And uh, I'm very thankful for the tremendous support that my family gave me in that process, particularly my my wife, Lauren, and the children. It was a very, very scary time being told as a qualified CA, um, having been CEO of a, a large IT distribution business, in fact, the largest in Africa, that you would never work again. So, you know, family and friends, and supportive, incredible medical teams. And, and I'd like to give a shout out to Sunlam as well, who were fantastic in this process. They put me through a extensive rehabilitation program that uh, allowed me to you know, overcome these injuries. So yeah, life, a lot of tough lessons learned during that process, but ones that I think uh, make one reflect very carefully on what's important in life. So I'm very, very thankful to be given the opportunity again to contribute in a senior role in the South African corporate. And uh, NAPAC has certainly been a challenging place for the last seven years. And, and Glenn, I think you said you are an advocate for then. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of professionals think about should I get death and disability? You know, you think about whether or not such insurance is necessary on your career pathway to success. What how have you seen it as beneficial? You know, Casey, I was the chairman of our previous pension and provident fund, and I remember designing the system along with the insurers with these extraordinarily good benefits. And the average age of our group was quite young being in the IT space, a lot of tech-focused individuals. And people used to get a bit grumpy around the proportion of their contribution to these funds that would go to covering insured risks. Having designed these risks for people, I never ever contemplated on being a beneficiary of the benefits. And I have to say that if you are not appropriately insured, please ensure that you go and get these covers because you know, Sunlam looked after me tremendously well financially, and they more importantly ensured that one's psychological needs during that time were also attended to, because it becomes a, a very dark place and very lonely place where, where you've gone from being the CEO of a, a big company to being, you know, <laughs> your biggest challenge is to get off a chair or a bed. Um, mm. and, and be able to move your right arm. I, I couldn't move my right arm for the whole year. And the pain that I endured was extraordinary. So, you know, having proper insurance so that your family isn't adversely impacted is absolutely critical. Great. Th thanks, Glenn. Uh, let me move over to Grathol. And Grathol, I think um, I liked your story of how you began. I mean, the people who may have not read the book who do not know your story being um, how you came into accounting, which I found an interesting uh, story. Perhaps you could just share how you came into accounting, how you chose accounting as a career. And, you know, do you regret the decision? Is, is accounting something to do? What would you have been if you hadn't become an accountant? And, you know, just the benefit of career guidance, which you don't seem to have got, do you think it is beneficial or are we just cut out to be what we become? Hmm. No, I mean, thank you very much, um, Casey, uh, for this opportunity to be, to be part of this um, wonderful book, a groundbreaking uh, book that um, you have authored um, and, and really listening to, to Glenn's story. And um, I have actually read your chapter at Glenn. I mean, it's a, um, it's, it's very, very inspirational uh, uh, story. So I'm glad to, to be, um, you know, to be part of the book uh, with you amongst uh, other people and also participating uh, this afternoon um, uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. I mean, you know, Casey, I come from a village called Bakenbeck. So that village is about 60 kilometers outside of 
uh, the then Potrites Res, uh, we now call it uh, Mukopani. Uh, so we hardly had a uh, career guidance. And when we had career guidance, um, it was through our teachers really trying to do their best. Uh, but really they had very limited uh, uh, knowledge as to what, what is available. I mean, they knew you could become a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a police, um, a man or, or a nurse, et cetera. So that's the sort of opportunities uh, that uh, I grew up um, at least knowing, um, you know, that are, it's, it's, it's something that I, could, that I could pursue. So as it then turned out, when I finished my metric, I, I decided, you know, I'm going to Johannesburg. So I, I came to Johannesburg. My late mom was a domestic worker at the time. And, um, and, and as it then happened, um, her employer happened to be a CA. So she was the first, at the time, first female uh, a, a partner at, at KPMG. Um, I didn't do any accounting, but she looked at me and she said, oh, my girl, uh, you are going to become an accountant. That was like, I didn't do accounting. You know, how am I going to manage? And she said, you know what? Don't worry, I'll teach you. I mean, she, she spent hours and hours teaching me debits and credits. Uh, I remember in my um, first exam, I actually got 12%. But she never, she never gave up, um, you know, until I became um, a, a CA. Uh, but throughout my career, uh, she has always been there to, to support me. I don't regret being a CA, and, uh, and 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 because it's just opened up so many opportunities for me. Um, Casey, you mentioned some of the things that I do on uh, on a part time basis, things like coaching, things like uh, commentary. I don't do commentary. Uh, 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 as much as I would love to, and um, you know, given the, the the limited time that that I have, but with the profession that I have, or that you know, I've 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 been privileged to 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 have, I'm able to to access those opportunities, uh, Casey. And I mean, is is career guidance uh, um, overrated? Um, which is one of uh, one of your questions. I have, I have found that when I go back to um, some of my former schools, they, 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 the kids there are really waiting for role models. They're waiting for inspiration. They're waiting for someone to actually remind them that it can happen. Um, and uh, I used to have the talks where I would say to, uh, uh, to the students, you know, uh, at some point I was sitting on the same desk that you are sitting and look where I am now. I am a qualified child accountant, so it can happen. And I've actually, uh, the, in those times that I've been, um, the students will phone me afterwards asking for opportunities. I mean, some have become CAs, some have managed to, to access funding uh, through organizations such as the IDC, which is the organization that um, you know, I used to work for where I introduced. So career guidance, I think it's a, I think it's a must um, and, uh, 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 you know, us as professionals going back to the schools where uh, we come from, um, but also empowering the teachers about what are the other opportunities that are there in the market, just, you know, in addition to just being um, a teacher or a nurse, uh, etc. that you can actually become a CA, you can become an astronaut. Great. And Grathol, some of the people I suppose who have joined the webinar may be Gibbs students who are perhaps at you know, a nexus in their careers where they're thinking of contemplating doing something else, or they're also having issues in their, you know, in their professional lives, you know, as a, as an executive coach, what type of issues have you seen that people will have? What is the benefit of getting coaching from an executive coach? And what do you think about the idea of people or of it never being too late to do something different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, your, your question is quite uh, big, um, a, a Casey, but I think, you know, there's a couple of things that uh, appear uh, and, and in, mostly in women, but I'm sure there are in men. Uh, it's the lack of self-confidence mm -hmm. uh, in, in oneself, uh, where when there's opportunities, I would say, you know what, I am not ready for this. Um, you know, can someone else, can you, can you pick someone else? But so mm -hmm. building that, self-confidence, building that trust in self, uh, it's very, very important because when the opportunities arrive, um, you know, then you'll, you'll, take out those, you'll take up those opportunities. And I think the other thing is making sure that you don't stay as 
um, you know, let's say you are CA, you've been in financial uh, management for years, do something else, do executive coaching, you know, do, um, you know, what else? I mean, become an economist, do economic commentary. The, you know, there's just so many opportunities uh, out there uh, where there's opportunities to always uh, reinvent, uh, uh, reinvent uh, 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 yourself. But I think the, the, the other thing that I think uh, I'm finding that is, is, is actually um, uh, coming up more strongly, I mean, in, in our workplace, uh, I think in, in South Africa and in, in, in other women as well, is the looking after oneself, uh, mm -hmm. looking after one's health. I mean, at Len, you, you touch on the, on the matter of, you know, if, if you don't have your health, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you, you really cannot do anything. So really taking the opportunity to, to reflect and to pause and to be grateful to be alive um, mm -hmm. and really taking time out and looking after one's health. That is very, very important. Great, thank you. Thanks, Grafel. And, and, and Glenn, if we come back to you, you know, uh, we talked about you being at NAMPAC and any person who's listening in, in this webinar who knows about NAMPAC may know the story of the kind of challenges the packaging industry is going through. Um, I don't know, what keeps you, the question of what keeps a CFO up at night, I'm sure there's a lot that keeps you up at night in packaging. Uh, but maybe you can you can share that. And also, in answering that, let us know also whether you wish you were in an industry that was flourishing, where there were no where there are no issues day to day, where you go to bed at night knowing that the the bank is full, salaries will be paid, and so on. Yeah, Gassy, uh, it's a, it's an interesting industry. I, I've come back to. I was in with Malbec. We unbundled. The whole of Melbeck and was left with just the packaging business. <clears throat> then I worked in the packaging business as a divisional finance director for four years and then went and ran this IT business for 15 years and ended up back in this industry. And you know, not a lot's really changed, I suppose, in the industry from a structural point of view. But what what has you know is still prevalent is that the converter being the manufacturer in the middle is still expected to produce significant returns to shareholders um, despite extraordinarily significant input cost increases that come our way. We've seen it recently with um, aluminium prices doubling. Uh, we've, and then we've seen also on the, the customer side, customers who are large and very, very large international players wanting you know, very, very favorable terms. So you end up being almost a manufacturer and a bank to both those parties. And what one has also seen is that certain suppliers into our industry has have not had balance sheets that can accommodate a doubling in input costs. Mm. They've got static credit, uh, credit limits, volumes have increased during you know, post-COVID times. And what keeps me awake tremendously is, is NAMPAC's capital structure, because before I joined, there was a strategy of exiting low margin, low barrier to entry businesses, and then investing in high growth markets um, north of our borders, two in particular being Angola and Nigeria. And all that investment, which is pretty well publicized, was done on dollar denominated funding. And the mm -hmm. challenge that happened there was that they were in economies where there were pegged currencies. And where there's a pegged currency, my warning to any potential uh, investor in those kind of environments be very, very circumspect because at some point in time, that pegging of the currency is certainly going to um, you know, unpeg. And when it does unpeg, it unpegs with extreme violence. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the country to make the goods affordable, they have to let the currency run. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, you know, essentially wage increases don't keep pace with demand. And, um, or price increases and demand drops. And mm -hmm. what has happened, those particular in, in, you know, economies of Angola and Nigeria have been very heavily dependent on oil. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, oil prices were at one stage at a peak of $127. You know, they dropped to $27 a barrel and it caused extreme financial pressure for NAMPAC over these years where it's been very difficult to extract the profits that you make uh, and first and foremost, even just repay 
um, you know, the, the, the procurement company that does all the procuring for us. So what keeps us awake is ability to transfer money freely out of these economies and then the knock-on effect um, to our funding structures. And, you know, NAPAC has several very, very deep relationships with uh, funding parties. Um, we have uh, an extensive consortium that have funded us. But, you know, I suppose deep questions then get asked around the capital structure of our business. And I think it's well publicized that uh, there's an expectation that we, you know, reduced our, our net interest bearing debt by uh, a further billion rand. We reduced it substantially in the prior year, effectively by two billion rand. We had to disinvest from our glass business and also a cartons business in Nigeria. But I think the, 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 the capital structure has kept me awake late at night because you know, looking through cycles is maybe something accounting needs to think more carefully about. And I think particularly of when one analyzes your weighted average cost of capital, it's a, an annual hardy with the auditors as to what these numbers are. And when countries go into difficulties linked to things that I've just described, typically what happens is in-country risk premiums increase. Mm. And at the same time, when one forecasts the cash flows, the auditors will want more moderate cash flows going forward. So you get this combined effect of a higher weighted average cost of capital and lower expected future cash flows, which culminates in a cocktail of a lower valuation, where in most of these valuation models, 80% of the value sits in the terminal year. And mm -hmm. then to the extent that you carry any goodwill on your balance sheet and you're forced to impair it, you can never unimpair that goodwill when cash flows return or in-country risk premiums drop. Yeah, so, accounting rules don't allow you to. <laughs> yeah, so you, you end up with a business that gets saddled with a, almost an artificially high on the face of a gearing ratio, which changes the risk patterns within the business and perceptions of investors and funders. And it yeah. becomes a, a very, very tricky um, set of facts to manage. And then... Yeah. Within a consortium, you could have very different risk profiles. So, you know, where you where you fund your businesses, my recommendation to people is think very carefully about the transferability of cash from these particular regions. And, you know, there's a lot of, I suppose, power in leverage. There also becomes a lot of inflexibility out of becoming too overgeared, particularly mm -hmm. where there are macroeconomic factors that you just simply can't control. So, you know, for me, my last seven years has been an extraordinary um, education in what can really hurt you in Africa for macroeconomic things that really are outside of one's control and that you need to structure your affairs that can take into account those abnormal arrangements. You know, we've seen in Zimbabwe at the moment and currencies really... You know, hitting the skids there, it's devalued dramatically. The expectation is that that is going to be devalued further. And trying to then account for hyperinflationary effects and all these kind of things get quite uh, difficult for analysts to understand, interpret, and more so, I suppose, in the preparer's world to prepare the financial statement. So it all culminates in quite a stressful environment for all finance-related people, and mm. particularly those at the helm trying to give guidance to to stock markets and to, to fund it. So these are things that have kept me awake and you know, I'm very thankful I've got an extraordinarily talented team of people with me who help me assess all these particular you know, challenging times and we've thankfully been able to navigate through them thus far. So, so thanks, Glenn. thanks for that, Glenn. And I see there are questions coming through. Please do type your questions. We will save the questions for the end. Um, but I think you didn't answer my second part, which was whether or not you wished you were in a, in, a, in, a, in a bullish company, in a swimming company, rather than one that has choppy waters. You know, Cassie, I, when I left Melbourne and Wilcola, I was attracted to an IT distribution company that was close to going insolvent. And mm. I remember driving all the way to Cape Town with my late father. And we were talking about you know, leaving a comfortable environment and going into an uncomfortable environment. And he said to me, Glenn, and he was a chartered accountant and a seasoned individual, he said, you must think of what's 
what you can create out of where you're going mm. and what you can make of that and the difference you can make in people's lives by getting that right. Mm. And I, I think of that tremendously because, you know, it's easy when it's easy. It's tough mm. when it's tough, but you grow when it's tough. Mm. Going to work every day and just doing the simple things and, and looking good because it's easy. I don't think builds you as a, as a professional individual. It doesn't um, grow you and test you. Look, there are very, very many days where I do feel I've grown enough and would like to maybe <laughs> step back from growing. But, you know, it, it, life is a journey and, you know, you've got to confront these brutal facts and you've got to make decisive, you know, decisions on these things. And, you know, yes, I would love to have been in a business that was the, the kind of share price was propelling its way up. Would I have learned as much? Probably not. Great. And, and Grathol, your industry right now is, is different from, from, from Glenn's, but, and maybe there are people who do not know what Tebe does. So maybe just fill us in on what Tebe Investments Group is um, and uh, what keeps you up as, at night as the financial director of that group. Hmm. So Tebe Investments was formed 30 years ago. So on the 1st of July, we celebrated uh, 30 years. Um, and, 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 and really, Tebe is premised on uh, building communities. We do have, um, as an investment company, so that's really who we are, we do have a portfolio of investments um, that includes uh, uh, SDSA, so that's Shell South Africa. Uh, we've got a portfolio in food, in services, uh, in logistics, in cleaning, in catering, uh, in renewable. Um, so we do have quite a, a diverse uh, a portfolio of, uh, of, in, of, of investments. Uh, we would love for it to be more balanced. Um, and that is actually one of the things that is uh, uh, keeping me and uh, I think the rest of the team here at Tebe um, are yeah. um, making sure that we've got a, a balanced uh, portfolio uh, in as far as uh, growth is concerned uh, and in as, far as, uh, uh, um, in as far as cash is concerned. I think what uh, probably is important uh, uh, to mention, I think it really has served uh, Tebe very well. Uh, just before or, or during the time when we were uh, dealing with the uh, COVID um, uh, uh, issues, uh, it's actually it was, it was before, just before my time, uh, my colleagues at the time looked at the portfolio and in that portfolio we had um, a, a tourism, a huge exposure within tourism uh, mm. sector and I mean we all know uh, what happened with COVID. I mean we couldn't mm. go anywhere and, and, and they, they, that particular sector uh, struggled. But what we also then did was to say with the portfolio that uh, we are keeping, uh, what are the things that um, you know, the things that we need to, 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 to do uh, to support the business, you know, either, um, you know, injecting uh, liquidity for, for a certain period of time uh, so that, um, you know, the particular company can run uh, or protecting cash. I mean, cash really was the, was, was, the, was the main thing at the time where it was important for us to monitor each and every cent and making sure that we only spend where we need to be spending, but also, um, you know, noting that you, you don't want to keep, um, for instance, if you think of maintenance, you, you know, mm. you want to make sure that um, you do spend money, even if you don't have it on maintenance, because if you don't, then, you know, the, your assets will not uh, give you the, will not be able to perform. And it's like, uh, it's like when you are owning, um, we are owning a car. So that allowed us, um, you know, to then transition um, into COVID, in the, into the COVID world, where the sort of the portfolio that we knew that it was exposed, we then worked, um, you know, that portfolio uh, out. But then, the, the, as I mentioned, the portfolio that we, we had, we then looked at the companies where we thought they, they might be a lot more vulnerable and we gave the necessary support, but then also made sure that we remain very uh, close to them. It also became very important that we worked with our partners, um, our, land, our lenders. I mean, I must say that we've got very, very supportive uh, lenders, um, you know, to make sure that if, uh, you know, if our covenants are tight, um, you know, we can have conversations around, you know, how do we, you know, how do we maneuver ourselves within, you know, in that period while, uh, 
uh, we're riding out, uh, uh, we're riding, we're riding out COVID. And I must say, we have seen significant improvements, uh, Casey, in our portfolio uh, since uh, uh, COVID has passed. Uh, I mean, we, we've seen uh, with many people retaining at the offices. I mean, I'm sitting in my office at the moment, and some of my mm. colleagues are also uh, uh, sitting here. Um, and 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 so you know, business. Most businesses are now coming back. Uh, we've also seen, which is one of one in one of the companies uh, that we, uh, we 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 have in, we invested in. They do catering, uh, they do cleaning. Uh, we've seen numbers coming back uh, at the hospitals now, where people are are now going back to do um, operations that were not, uh, or procedures that previously you could not do them uh, during COVID. So we've seen, yeah. uh, you know, we, so we've seen the, the, the uh, uh, coming back, uh, um, you know, the portfolio really coming back. But the challenge um, has now also been, um, you know, which is, I guess is, you know, in, 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 in working around the portfolio is the things that have happened um, with, the, the Ukraine uh, and Russia mm -hmm. conflict. Um, right. And I mean, you know, everyone has really struggled. I mean, we know uh, the input costs, the fertilizer mm -hmm. costs. I mean, I've mentioned that we are invested in the, in the food uh, uh, portfolio. The fuel, the fuel costs are going uh, up mm -hmm. uh, uh, every day. And so, mm -hmm. you know, making sure- And it that doesn't help the rand is now, uh, I don't know if the exchange rate is also having an impact lately on your portfolio. Mm. Um, not so much, uh, uh, um, not, not so much, not indirectly, uh, 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 Casey, um, indirectly. Um, and I've, I've now just lost my, um, the, the point that I was trying to-, to, to uh, oh, Sorry, to you're talking case. about Ukraine yeah. and- uh, Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, and so now, you know, we are then saying, uh, you know, making sure that uh, we work with um, you know, our land, our, you know, getting even more closer to our lenders, working with our customers, um, mm. you know, and making sure that the, the, the relationships that we have with our customers, they become more of a partnership because it mm. does not help, um, you know, if we go to, if, you know, if we sell, uh, uh, if they're squeezing us, if they're squeezing mm. um, uh, um, uh, the margins because our businesses are not going to survive and they will not have the product. Uh, in the future and um, when, you know, when they need the product. So we found that it's really about working uh, in partnership and our staff uh, as well. And um, because, um, because the economy has not grown um, and, um, and, 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 and so we're not at some point, you know, you can't, um, uh, 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 sometimes the, the, the increases that we're giving, we're not even able to make inflation, but how do we make sure that we work with our staff and making sure that we run and continue running the sustainable businesses, as well as considering the communities around us, noting the point that I've mentioned that a TEBE is premised on building communities. Great, and, and I, I mean, TEBE, you've described what TEBE does, which is basically invest in entities and exit. So how do you, and I think this is just not on a company point of view, of course, as an investment entity, you do it on a regular basis, whereas uh, we as individuals also do it as individuals, you try and enter into an investment, how do you select the investment, how do you time when to enter the investment, and how do you determine when? I know you don't always get it right. Nobody does. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the things that you think about in your own pursuit of personal and as a uh, and corporate success, the entry point, the sweet spot to enter, and the sweet spot to exit an investment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's always a risk of staying too long and, and destroying value, uh, mm -hmm. but also exiting too early and leaving well, yeah. money on the table. Um, mm -hmm. And so what we try and do, uh, amongst others, is to really stick on our lane. Uh, we know what, um, you know, what we're good at. Um, I mean, you know, just using renewables. Uh, 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 I, mean, we've, I mean, we've been in the renewables game for many years. Um, and so we know that, you know, mm -hmm. what works and what doesn't work. What are the minimum returns that we should be looking at? What are the risks? Um, mm -hmm. And if there's a, 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 if we're not able to make the minimum uh, returns that we are, are looking for, what are the things uh, that we can do to be able to, you know, to, to, to achieve those sort of 
uh, uh, returns at entry point, but also at um, uh, at the at the uh, um, exit point. I mean, I I, I think the, the the other point, uh, Casey, is you know always scanning in the market and understanding uh, what is out there, what is the next, um, mm. and mm. you know because that then allows us um, you know to be able to exit. Uh, at the right, well, it, at the optimal level, um, you know, where we have made um, uh, uh, sufficient returns, uh, but be mm-hmm. able to then use, uh, in, you know, um, invest the, the, the funds uh, uh, elsewhere as well. Mm. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Grathol. Glenn, let me come back to you. And uh, so, so, a- so, 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 yeah, so, sorry, Casey, but I think, yeah. I think the, 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 the last point I wanted to make uh, around sure. here is that at the end of the day, cash is king, um, mm. and you know you 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 know um, you can hold on to the investment, but if it's not yielding the necessary uh, cash that you need, uh, mm. I mean you can't eat growth. I mean you can sit with a company yeah. that is growing for 10, 20 years, uh, but yeah. at the end of the day, there's there's a, uh, you need an investment that uh, yields uh, uh, cash. Okay, so liquidity is a key thing. Are we talking here dividend policies of investees or what are you looking at in terms of saying that uh, cash is king for, from an investment point of view? Well, for us um, as an investment company, uh, it's, it's mm. important that we reward our shareholders yeah. uh, we, you know, through dividends, uh, that we also reward, reward our stakeholders through um, uh, initiatives that we are involved in uh, around entrepreneurship, around the scholarship funds uh, that mm. we have. So that's really at, uh, at the investment company level. And for us to be able to do that, it's important that uh, the companies that we are invested in, uh, it's important that they must, they must give us the necessary cash. Uh, they must generate mm. cash, they must deliver the cash mm. to us, uh, but also they must reinvest the cash in the business as well as in the community. Great. And Glenn, I don't know what you have to say about what uh, Grathol is saying, whether or not there are any similarities or anything you want to add on to that. And as you do so, perhaps also just tell us about strategies for success, you know, and how you uh, craft an effective strategy. Cassie, you know, I, I think we, we are all in the business of trying to generate cash. And I suppose mm-hmm. businesses go through, through different cycles. Um, you know, when they, they're growing, they tend to eat, eat cash quite substantially, firstly in, the, in putting the capex down to start with, and then in the growth phase from a working capital perspective. But I think it's absolutely critical and, you know, that, that businesses really clearly define, firstly, their working capital cycles, because I think in many cases, people don't give enough credence to how far you can get that wrong. I've worked in businesses that are, are very, very cash flush. And I have to say, when you look at the correlation between working capital management and a business that's often with too much cash, the working capital actually isn't as tight as it should be. Whereas if you work in a company where, where, where cash is tight, working capital is optimized. So I think there's a, a very, very real um, relationship there that one needs to, to, to go and manage and, and, and look at. I, I look at what uh, Greth is telling us you know, we've, we've got, you know, certain businesses that we've done very well in, and despite us needing to get certain dividends back, sometimes the countries in which you've invested are restrictive in terms of your ability to get the dividends back. So mm-hmm. ultimately, as you, as you say, you, you can't eat growth. You've got to actually mm-hmm. somehow get dividend back to the center, for the center to be able to resume a dividend policy. Yeah, so there's a balance there. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, Strangely enough, in a, and then when you go into a hyperinflationary environment, particularly like Zimbabwe, you need to spend the cash as fast as you can on non-monetary assets so that you avoid any depreciation in the currency. So, you know, it depends on what environment you're in and what economics face you, you know, how you, you extract the cash. And there is a point in time, I suppose, from a, addressing capital structures of companies that you've also got to sit back and say, you've done well on a particular asset for a long period of time from an earnings perspective. Mm. But there's also time in which that, as Tebe does, they say, well, look, it's reached its maturity and now it needs to be sold and address you know, other concerns within in the structure. And I think 
you know, looking at trying to craft uh, an appropriate strategy. strategy. Yeah. yeah. I suppose it's very relevant to where a company finds itself in its life cycle. Mm. If it's, you know, in an early infant stage and it's got, um, you know, investors who are happy to, to, to keep investing in, for, in the business and, and receive dividends in a later environment, that's, that's great. And investors will invest for growth there. If you're in a far more mature business, I think you've got to be looking at, you know, ways and means that the engine room of the working capital can be at least funded by the growth and also moderate dividends. Now, I would, in a, in a strategy, also be very careful on luring investors with a dividend yield or dividend policy that is not sustainable. Mm. Because, you know, it is, it's very easy for shareholders to get caught up in a, in a, a rising African narrative, let's say, um, where people were able to pay quite significant dividends historically. And yet you cannot change, and then you have to change dividend policy dramatically. So setting a dividend policy that doesn't have to fluctuate um, and that can be sustainable, I think, is a very real part of one strategy. Uh, you know, I've unfortunately at NAMPAC been, I think, the first finance director in 33 years to actually have to recommend switching the dividend policy off. And that has been had to happen as part of the slow process of recapitalizing the business. And you can clearly mm. see what happens in that environment is your investor universe gets impacted because many, many of the funds are actually looking for dividend yield, mm. not only growth. And you end up limiting your, your investor universe. So I think as you're building a strategy, thinking about how much capital needs to be reinvested to sustain the business is critical. How much yeah. capital needs you are prepared to, to put into the business to fund growth is critical yeah. and how much money you can afford to return to shareholders without compromising the capital structure of the business is absolutely critical and particularly in companies where capital expansion is lumpy in nature uh, and particularly where you can't buy the step out equipment on a modular basis and i think of nampac as an example you, you can't go and buy a canning line for an extra 200 million cans you have to go and buy a canning line that does 1 billion cans. Oh, and, you know, you have to invest the capital in that. And mm -hmm. you either go big or you go home. Yeah, and the, the, the point is, you, you, there are not that many economies within, let's say, Africa that have got a population big enough to sustain that investment. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be very careful to be chasing growth, but compromise your financial risks in your gearing ratio and your ultimate liquidity. So I think building successful strategies is if you're myopic, you're going to hurt yourself. You have to be, you know, considering short-term, medium-term and long-term aspira uh, aspirations of, of shareholders and funders. Because if, you, if the business gets too heavily funded by the funders, as opposed to the shareholders, you end up with a position where there's rub between those two, two universes and finding the appropriate balance between the funding of the business between those parties is, is absolutely critical. And I think having deep and meaningful relationships with your funding partners is critical and having shareholders that are prepared to go, you know, the, the, the mile with you is, is um, very important. Now, I suppose in, in a private business, that's quite different because guys are not typically in it for the short term and then, you know, getting out in a listed environment, is a certain portion of your shareholder register that certainly is long-term players. Hmm. But there is a certain portion that are in and out of the- Yeah, um, speculators. And particularly where you have hedge funds and the guys shorting the share and all of their whole lot of dynamics that one needs to, to um, accommodate. So I think in the strategy, you know, if lines go up in perfect uh, sync, sometimes yeah. the investment community love that, but it's not in my, experience um, that real it seems to be too managed because in essence life happens yeah. market change and mm -hmm. you have to build the strategy around catering for those economic shocks that can come your way and i think the pandemic has taught us that um, i don't yeah. think we all set out in our careers we could ever possibly have mm -hmm. imagined having to mm -hmm. cope with the absolutely left of field um, scenarios that have come uh, our way. And I think, you know, one of my last points is 
probably scenario planning in the strategy is critical. Yeah. Also, maybe, you know, it's all very well building the budget uh, for next year, bottom up, and the, in regards to the strat plan going forward. Yeah. But you also want to look at it maybe from the top down as an investor uh, in the, at the corporate office who's protecting the shareholder value and also be quite clinical in who well, does a particular investment that you've got or subsidiary actually meet your long-term aspirations or not. And if it doesn't, I think confronting the brutal facts and dealing with it sooner rather than later is probably you know, a very important thing. Great. Let, let me jump on to some of the questions I'm seeing in the chat. Maybe let me start with Rufaro's. He's asking, as the world moves into temporary deglobalization, how are you protecting local value chains? Let's start with you, Glenn. It's a, it's a very interesting question, Casey. Um, you know, we had a, a local supplier in one of our diversified and food can businesses, which is a very big business. Yeah, um, it was located 20 kilometers from our particular plant. And some years ago, we, we struggled with certain supply issues and quality issues. And we had to, unfortunately, then go and procure um, these supplies from international markets, being China and Japan. And, mm. you know, what we've learned out of that process is how complicated it can make your supply chain. Mm. Because you know, a very small customer in a massive environment and if you miss your slot or get out of your slot, your supply chains can be significantly disrupted. So I think to the extent that we can source locally and maybe have the hard discussions with your suppliers where the quality is dropping or the investment isn't sufficient to meet your standards. I think as a country, we need to try and have those hard discussions first. If we mm -hmm. can't sort them out locally, well, unfortunately, we're going to have to source internationally. And the sad part of uh, our experience is that where one has not been able to achieve that and protect local industry, you know, clearly, you know, employment gets tremendously affected. And when it's regionally based, the multiplier effect on that region of several hundred people losing their, their jobs is, is quite catastrophic. So, you know, we are trying to, at all costs, uh, or, or reasonable costs, protect our local um, procurement, but there are many areas where we simply can't. Um, and we've had one of our suppliers um, also apply for import duty against us looking for external supplies. So trying to balance the keeping local suppliers honest and not um, paying the wrong price, but also simplifying supply chains is a fine, fine art. So I think, you know, on a, a really really ethical basis, one would want to support local suppliers, but I suppose trying to produce a return for shareholders, you also have to be procuring at the, the best possible price. Yeah. Gratha, let me ask a different question. This one's from Linda. She's, I don't know, in your heart, many CFOs hold, hold uh, wear the hat of also being responsible for IT in the company. So this may be relevant uh, to you also in at, at Tebe. So Linda's asking, in light of TransUnion's data breach, how safe are my funds and my data? Should I choose to invest with the Tebe group? So firstly, I suppose the first question there is, can Linda invest with Tebe? And secondly, are you handling, uh, how are you handling uh, data and, and, and funds? Yeah. No, th thanks. Thank, thank you for that question. So as an investment company, We've got um, institutional investors, and then we've got a management that owns the business. Uh, so that would be typically our shareholders, and those are the people that we call uh, the investors. So we don't, we're not listed on the market. Uh, we don't have uh, individuals that are not associated with Tebe uh, that we can uh, call them as investors. Um, uh, hopefully at some point, uh, we will also be listed uh, on the on the stock exchange, and then you can come and invest uh, in Tebe. Uh, we do have a, a very strong portfolio. I think a point uh, that I, I have uh, um, I have uh, uh, made uh, uh, before. Um, with regard to IT, uh, I mean, I think it's just you know making sure that um, you you've got a very strong IT uh, supplier. I mean, we. 
we outsource uh, our IT to a very competent uh, uh, company. So they take, they look after the entire security, uh, cyber security, uh, and making sure that our firewalls are refreshed uh, every so often, um, making sure that you do penetration tests, uh, et cetera, uh, to see um, you know, if a potential hacker would want to hack your system, how vulnerable would you be? And making sure that any areas uh, there, uh, that you know, any gaps that you might have in your IT systems um, are, are addressed. Um, and, I, I, and I think it also depends on the size of the organization. Uh, I mean, we are, we are a large organization, but we're not a big organization. So we try and make sure that everything that we do around IT and actually in everything that we do, uh, it must be fit, uh, it must be fit uh, for, for purpose. Uh, even the, the, the protection mechanisms that we are implementing uh, at the moment uh, around uh, cyber security, um, you know, is um, the cost versus benefit of, of, us, um, of us doing that. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, fortunately we're not like a trans union um, where um, uh, still protection of, of, of uh, personal information is very important uh, at Tebe and we've, you know, we've put in uh, mechanisms that we continuously monitor all the time. But fortunately, um, you know, even if we were to be uh, attacked, uh, we're not gonna be, um, as affected at the sort of level that your transunion would be would be affected. Yeah. And Chabeli here, she says, well said in as far as generating cash for both investors and communities. So I think that part about communities is quite critical. I think we are touching there on both uh, CSR and uh, ESG. So maybe we can just transition to, to your thoughts on, on this question concept of ESG that is now vogue, you know, the idea of environmental, social, and corporate governance. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, we all are aware, right, of the, the, the fact that we're not looking after environment. Um, the, you know, it's all of a sudden, it's extremely hot, it's extremely cold, um, and, and it just rains. I think about three weeks ago, it just rained. Uh, yeah, and I think the flooding in KZN is related to, to environmental change, climate change. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. precisely. So, you know, if we're not um, le learning the, 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 the lessons uh, and making sure that we change our ways of doing forward, um, you know, we, we're going to end up not having, um, you know, a place that we'll always be able, that we'll be able to, to live uh, comfortably, comfortably in. And I think, uh, Casey, the issues around climate change, um, I think they've been spoken about, um, and I think there's been a lot of emphasis uh, around uh, climate change. You know, there's funds that are being raised uh, around um, uh, this sort of uh, initiatives, including renewables. Uh, but the, the, the one area that we have not really focused a lot of our attention on uh, is around, um, uh, is around the, the, the S side, uh, the social side. Mm. Um, so it's 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 always been seen as um, you know you can just do CSI you can just put in mm. you can just open a, a dressmaking school um, mm. and I'm just using a mine some mines in the past you know they would create mm. a dressing school um, you know as opposed to actually making sure that um, that particular mine works with the community um, and and building skills around the community so that those community members, those young uh, boys and young girls uh, at some point would be able to work as engineers uh, in the mine. Mm. And so that is really our um, focus as Tebe to say um, in, the, in the environment where we are working, um, it's important for us to work with the communities. It's important for us to, uh, to partner with communities in terms of skills, um, uh, in terms of you know, other initiatives such as supporting um, uh, the schools in the area, uh, uh, um, for, for, for instance. So the social side is very, very important. And it really is the core of what, um, you know, what, what, what TEVE uh, stands for. Uh, on an annual basis, we spend, um, you know, in excess, and for that, uh, you can imagine for the type of organization that we are, uh, mm -hmm. in, in excess of 5 million rents uh, per annum, uh, just on um, on on uh, educating students uh, 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 every year, and so for us, it is very very important 
What we also then do in addition to that, we do take some of those students and we employ them as, um, as interns in the various businesses that we are, um, we are invested in, as well as those of our partners. Um, and then making sure that, you know, when they're done with their interns, then there's opportunities for them within the, within the, the Teva group or elsewhere. But we know that when they live here, they will live with the, um, they will live with the, the, the necessary skills. I mean, governance, um, I mean, we, 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 I think we, you know, we all can agree um, on this call that if there's no proper governance, uh, things mm. fail. It's important. Yeah, we are seeing, we are seeing that, I think, Grathol, with many companies that we are hearing are failing, yeah. Yes, yes, precisely. Mm. Um, mm. You know, where you don't have the segregation of duties, uh, mm. where you have, um, you know, someone or, you know, a leader who can, um, you know, who can um, buy stuff, who can decide to buy, pay for the stuff, um, and, and, and basically make the entire decision making. I mean, we have found um, within, within Tebe and other organizations, um, you know, that I have served uh, in the past, you know, making sure that the decisions, there's always checks and balances. Um, mm. You know, there's someone who does um, you know, who execute, there's someone who signs off, um, and that, um, you know, even the, the decision, the, the decision making, uh, that you have a very strong, um, uh, skilled and qualified board of directors, uh, because even as executives, we can make decisions, but it's important to have that, you know, that sign off, uh, where there's someone who's got oversight, uh, to make sure that you execute on the strategy, that you deliver on the strategy, you deliver on the promises um, that, that you have made. So corporate governance, uh, we have seen in this organization, it works for us and it really is something that we, we, uh, uh, we, pride, uh, we pride ourselves uh, for. There's something related here um, from Devet, and I think he asks uh, a question that would also be relevant to you, Grathel, because I believe you do have investments in energy. So Devet's asking, so if your company is, for example, in a dirty industry, such as coal mining, and you obviously need to strategically move to clean energy or any other industries, but on the other hand, you have investors who know uh, that if you leave coal, you know, you're taking the risk of losing some good returns, then how do you implement that survival st strategy to replace carbon emitting coal with return generating alternatives? You know, tunnel vision investors is what he says, yeah. Yeah, good, goodness. I mean, it's, it's as if, um, is, is it Brendan? Um, no, the it's uh, Hasselman. Is it Hasselman? Yeah, I mean, as yeah. if he's a, um, you know, he's sitting uh, here next to, next, next to yeah. my office. Um, I mean, earlier you asked you ask a question, um, a, a case, you know, as to whether there's within our portfolio, you know, whether mm. we are affected by the rent dollar exchange, yeah. um, uh, and uh, et cetera. And, mm. um, I, you know, I was looking at it more around the, the locally sort of based uh, portfolio, and I said, no, we do have exposure into coal. And I must mm. say, at this point in time, it has served us very well and i think that's the benefit of having a balanced a, a, a balanced portfolio mm -hmm. i think it's also important in the south african context and i think you know i think the the, the same response i guess would go on in africa on other emerging markets as well is that coal is here to stay and for mm -hmm. many years and i understand in other i think in i think it's in germany actually is it germany mm -hmm. or the uk they've just built uh, um, uh, some power stations, uh, coal power, coal fired uh, power station, um, mm -hmm. you know, similar to what we've done with um, uh, with Kusile and with Midupi. Um, yeah. But I think it's 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 really about you know how do you even as you you uh, say you build the coal fired uh, coal fired uh, power stations and even the power stations that are in existence, how do you make sure that um, you you install the mechanics, the mechanics that will then limit the impact on, on the environment in terms of the emissions. Um, mm -hmm. But I think coal is here for a long time, um, you know, a long time to, 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 to stay. Um, and I must say it really has served us well in as far as, um, you know, having a, a coal at this, at this point in time. Okay. 
Glenn, um, let me ask the question as, as we, we I see we've already done an hour. So as we, as we begin to wind down, let me ask you, and I know you've got a few sons who are now getting into, um, into different professions, well, son and a daughter, I believe. Um, what then is your advice uh, in terms of, I mean, what advice do you give the younger professionals, a number of the people here, uh, people who are still studying or mid-career, mid you know, uh, late 30s, early 40s type thing? How do you get, I mean, they may be wishing to get into the C-suite, maybe not CFOs, but could be CIOs or even COOs or COOs. What are the I mean, how do you get there? How do you get there and what advice do you have for, for career professionals? Cassie, thank you for that very relevant question. I think, you know, sometimes there's the, the kind of want for immediate gratification in life. Mm. And it seems to be a, a trend that maybe the younger generation expect more than we did as, as old uh, middle-aged kind of people. My advice to people would be, you can't build a house by putting the roof on first. Mm. You have to get the foundation strong first. <laughs> and you can't get the foundation in one year or two years or three years. It takes a long time to, to build that. And you will do yourself a disservice trying to shunt your way up the, the ladder too quickly without the appropriate scars on your back and having hands on done the work. Mm. You know, I, I've been lucky in some respects, I suppose, not to have done too much of the detailed work. And my wife laughs at me because I have probably never ever generated an invoice in my life or, or, or made a payment in a, in a company system because I've been lucky to maybe bypass that, that side. But, you know, mm -hmm. I, I understand very well detailed accounting and it's taken me a long time to do that. I understand, you know, dealing with the corporate finance people, the treasury people, the HR people, the, you know, the, the, the people in the costing side of the business, dealing with the shareholders. And you know, that takes years and years and years of experience. Now, I think one must not play down people's ambition. We want people to be ambitious, but be realistic about your ambition. Because sometimes you know, I, I interact with people who maybe haven't got enough scars on their back, but seem to know ostensibly a tremendous amount of how it works on the ground. And when you start explaining to them that it's not quite as easy as that, they start eventually listening and learning. So you know, my experience has taught me that spend time in the trenches, spend time with people you know. Mm. We've given one mouth and two ears. Use your ears more than your mouth. You learn a lot. Mm. And learn from people who've gone before you because they are free lessons that people are able to give you. Um, you know, I've got um, three children. Uh, the eldest son has finished his business science degree at, uh, at UCT and he's doing his articles in London, did it very well in his matric and got eight distinctions. The other son has got um, doing his BAC, he's in third year and he did very well in matric and got seven A's. And these guys are working tremendously hard. They didn't get there by just getting there. These are young guys who've watched my household. And my wife's also a qualified chartered accountant. And we work in tough industries. So she's a PPC, I'm in obviously NAMPAC. And they've seen that you don't get to these roles just by chance. You mm -hmm. actually have to you do the hard yards. You have to take a few knocks. Life's not easy. And mm -hmm. you know, to expect that life goes up in straight lines Please don't fool yourself. You're going to fail at certain things. And sometimes you're going to learn more about failing than just continuously succeeding. Mm. And don't be scared of failing because and don't be scared of putting yourself in a position where you think, wow, I'm out of my depth here. Mm. Put yourself in those zones, but ask people for help. People that can guide you, that can grow you, that can lead you. I've been extraordinarily lucky in my career. I've had wonderful teachers. I've had um, people who've took me by, taken me by the hand and, and grown me. They've mentors, they've, yeah. They've helped mm -hmm. me. I've had people like uh, Roy Anderson, who's you know, been boss of Liberty, boss of EY, boss of the Stock Exchange. I've had you know, um, Tito Mbaweni, who was our chairman. I've had fantastic people along the way that have, where I haven't quite cut it, said, okay, you've not 
kind of got it right there. Think about this or guide me here or when I've done well, also praise me. So mm -hmm. my, my advice to, to people is, you know, realize that you're going to fail sometimes. It's not a sin. Mm -hmm. It's actually probably more of a sin not to fail because you're not stretching yourself and putting yourself in a zone that is stretching yourself enough to fail. Mm. So, you know, those who I think get to where they're going are prepared to stick their neck out a little bit and say, I'm going to learn. And sometimes it's by hard experiences, but rather mm. put yourself in that zone than just coast along. And I suppose it goes back to, you know, that question you asked me earlier, would you not prefer to be in a, a simple industry that's flying in that? You know, my, my dad always used to, to laugh and say, Glenn, why did you not just go and run the 100 meters why did you choose to do the 400 meter hurdles mm. I said, well, that was more a feeling of satisfaction when you finished something where there were things in your way mm. than just do the things that are easy an so, obstacle course yeah so my encouragement to people is don't be scared of the ob obstacles don't be scared to train hard and get mm. tired and sometimes feel fatigued because mm. ultimately that's how you're going to learn you don't know yeah through university in, in, in three weeks, it takes you three years to get a degree. Sometimes mm. it doesn't take you one year to get your honours. Some people have battled with that. Some people don't pass the board exam first time. But it's a yeah. case of staying the course Most. and not, yeah. not, not just wanting instant gratification. Mm. It, it's going to take time. And, you know, when I suppose, you, you, I suppose you've arrived, always realise there's someone who knows more than you and learn yeah. from them. And Glenn, you, are you back on your bike, the instrument that almost killed you? And if so, why? Um, Casey, I am back on my bike. And I suppose the reason I'm back on my bike is I refuse to let it beat me. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I've had tremendous support um, from family and friends. And, you know, one of my, my riding colleagues, Guy Strollendorf, uh, has encouraged me tremendously along this route. Um, a previous colleague of mine, Tony Kotzer, who has written 21 Augusts with me, has also been you know, encouraging along the way. And I just refused to give up. So uh, I was tremendously scared. You know, going down <clears throat> an incline of even two degrees, I used to be terrified. Mm -hmm. Going over 20 kilometers, I would be terrified. And, and slowly but surely, I've overcome the fear. And yeah. You know, I don't particularly want to go faster than 70 kilometers an hour on a bicycle. I'm, I get that that's the fastest I'd like to go. But I, I ride these races. I've done 23 Augusts now, seven since my accident. Mm. And I have been a 165k race in London three times, one of which was on the 29th of May. And I think it's just, for me, it's a symbol of not letting something that potentially could have killed me beat me. And yeah. you know, it's just... I suppose it's my personality. I just refuse to give up. Uh, you know, I do suffer every day with pain. And unfortunately, I have to be in medicine for the rest of my life. But those mm. are small prices to pay for the opportunity to live life again and, and compete. Yeah, to be alive, yeah. In sport and in, in business. And, yeah. you know, one has got to be grateful for these things. And I suppose, you know, a positive attitude is the biggest medicine to overcoming most things. So... I, I like to not give up. And, you know, riding is one of those things that is a challenge. You know, 165 k's is a long way. And, you know, it's you, you go through good times in the race and you go through times where you're hurt. But yeah. staying the course is really, I think, my message to people. Awesome. And Grathal, as we come to you, I, I'll also read this here from Brenda Molloy. I think I know Brenda. Uh, she's a young lady. She says, skills development is extremely important in communities that are often grant recipient households. And thank you for highlighting this graph uh, And, you know, for, for, for ladies like uh, Brenda, um, it's the same question really that I'm, I asked Glenn, which is basically the route to career success because, but, but unlike uh, Glenn and myself, you are a woman and a woman who's a financial director who obviously has special, well, different challenges from the ones that we have. So what message do you have particularly for women and, and, and Black women um, who are aspiring to be in the C-suite? What kind of challenges are you facing and how, how do they get there? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 it's actually very interesting that um, 
you chose to interview myself and Glenn. So mm. um, I'm actually at the, imagine in the middle of winter, I'm busy training for my ninth comet. Oh, um, great. And, and, and <laughs> so being um, as, uh, 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 you know, touching from uh, what uh, Glenn oh, wow. mentioned um, is that, you know, being goal driven. Uh, I mean, mm. I wake up in the morning, it's like two degrees Celsius winter. outside. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of winter, I must go and run. Uh, but, you know, for me, um, you know, it's about, you know, I know I have comrades coming on the 28th of August. Um, yeah. And I know I need to put in the work uh, because mm. if I don't put in the, the work, uh, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer yeah. comrades and who knows, maybe I might not be able to finish but I know I'm going to finish comrades and a particular time that I, I'm, I'm still uh, determined. So I'll determine it um, in two weeks time after I've done a 60 kilometer run because then I'll get a, I'll get a sense. But mm -hmm. I know that I've got this goal of finishing uh, comrades on the 20th, 28th of August. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of planning and, and a lot of sacrifices that I have to make um, uh, along the way, including um, you know, not going out when I really want to go out or having to leave the party early, leaving to leave um, a friend and, and also, um, you know, making sure that I, I build strong relationships with, with my colleagues so that they can be able to, to cover for me when, uh, when, when I'm not there. So in, in everything that, I've, that, I, that I do, and I think that's, that's really been, um, you know, what has driven my career for over the years. My first comrades was in 2009. And so that's a long time. Uh, and so I, I always reflect on um, why did I run comrades? Um, what did I achieve out of com comrades? Um, and I, I always go back to uh, the lessons that, I, that I, um, I, I continuously learn, even now, but I still make mistakes uh, along the way. And I will continue making mistakes and I will learn. Setting up the goal. Uh, and making sure that you pit, you put the building blocks of, of you know, how you're going to get there, including, um, you know, getting the right people to support you, the coaches, the mentors, um, the, you know, if there's money that is required, the time that is required, um, the attire that you, that, that you, that, that you need. Um, uh, 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 it's very, very, uh, very, very uh, important. So that's one. The second thing is getting, um, getting a coach. Uh, I think that is really, really uh, very, very important. Uh, and I mean, I can see with the, the, the years where I've used um, uh, one, of this, uh, um, one of these coaches, and I mean, the results really, they, um, they, 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 they speak for themselves. Uh, but once you have a coach, take advice from your coach. Um, and when I'm using, you know, a coach, I could also be referring to a mentor. I could be referring to... Um, a, a, you know, a peer mentor or even, you know, a, a someone that you consider, um, somebody that you regard highly, take their advice. Because if you don't, I promise you, um, you know, you will, you will learn, you will learn the hard way. I, I have learned the hard way where uh, my coach has given me instructions and he'll say, go and run 30 case and then I'm going to do 40 case. And I know then the following day, it's a disaster. Mm. A discipline and making sure that even when it's cold, it's raining, uh, it really doesn't matter. So um, when my clock goes uh, off, I know mm. it's time to go and run. So I don't even look at my time to see, um, you know, I have an idea of the time because I would have, um, um, so, I would have set it up front and yeah. what time I'm going to wake up. But when I wake up, I don't even check what is the temperature. Uh, I just wake up and just, you know, just prepare myself, put on the clothes, um, and then while I'm, 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 I'm finishing off, then I'll check the temperature if I need to layer. Uh, but by then I'm taking, I'm taking out my, my gloves and, uh, uh, and, and, and there I head out and then I go and run. I mean, within, uh, you know, literally after 250 meters, I'm warm and then I can go on for, I can go on, um, you know, for, I could, I could go on for hours. So yeah, being disciplined regardless of, um, you know, of, 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 um, you know, of, of, of what is happening. And if it's, mm. you know, like I mentioned, like if it's raining or it's cold, it really doesn't matter sticking to the plan. But what is also important, um, and, and, and Casey, it's, it's, it's one of the, the comments that I've made in, um, in, 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 in the book, uh, the mm. book of trust, um, having the self-trust yes. in one, yeah. 
And I think so, it's called the speed, the speed of trust is the book. The speed of trust, it. yes, yeah. the speed of trust. Mm. So, and I know, um, you know, I, I know I can believe in, I, I, I know I can trust myself. I know if I say tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to wake up and I go and run. And so the, the ability to be able to, to, to trust self, it's something that I have learned uh, over many, many years. Um, mm-hmm. And so I can rely on myself. And so, um, and, 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 I, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is that it's not only just, um, you know, the ability to be able to execute when you said you're going to execute something for yourself. Um, it's also goes to, you know, how do you then work with other people? Um, if you don't trust yourself, how do you then trust other people? And so I find that the ability to trust myself, I know that I'm what I'm bringing, um, you know, to, I'm bringing <laughs> to the table. Um, yeah. And then, you know, then I can bring myself, um, I can bring myself uh, a hold. So those are some of the lessons uh, that I've, I've learned with, with running in general. But of course, you know, also having, um, you know, the, uh, when you run, there's so many things that you get to see compared to, uh, um, you know, compared to when you are, when you are, are, are driving. I think as a woman, I, it's, I think in, I think in the past and things are changing, uh, but things are still, um, things are still quite challenging. Um, I mean, the, 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 the fact that, you know, I would look at myself in the room and be like, oh, I'm the only woman, you know, mm. uh, the imposer syndrome. Do I need to mm. be here? Um, the imposter you know, maybe syndrome, I'm here yes. because I'm a woman. Yes, maybe yeah. I'm here because I'm a woman. Oh, yes, I'm here because I'm black. Whatever mm. I'm going to say, um, mm. you know, doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, those kind of things, they then work in, um, in your self, well, in my case, in my self-confidence, where then I'm not able to bring myself uh, wholly, uh, authentic, because then I'm looking, and uh, when Glenn is saying something, I'm like, okay, but uh, Glenn is making, you know, he's making a better contribution than I am. Mm-hmm. When Casey is making a point, you know, then I'm like, okay, I might as well just sit here and not mm. not saying anything. Mm. So I think it's the ability to then be able to um, to work through that, um, you know, asserting yourself to yourself and just um, you know reminding yourself that uh, you are you are okay, you are enough. You don't need anyone else to remind you that um, remind you that you are enough. But what I, what has also um, served me quite well. Uh, is collaborating uh, with colleagues um, mm. and, you know, so that it does not become me and them, you know, so I'm a female and they're men and, you know, they're not going to be supportive um, and just making sure it, that in the settings where we are engaging, when I see um, an opportunity for them to, to, to grow, um, you know, for instance, if I can just use, um, a, 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 an example that, uh, uh, you know, generally it, it does happen in, in a lot of settings where because I'm a woman, I would make a point and people would say, okay, they would move on. And then a male makes the same point, but they put it differently. Now, mm. all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden it gets taken seriously. Yeah. So I do, you know, when, I, when, when something like that happens, um, yeah. you know, I would bring it to my colleague and say, but do, do guys, do you actually realize that I said this exactly the same thing? I mean, what is mm-hmm. different? Speak um, up, yeah. you know, yes, exactly. So mm-hmm. it's those sort of um, the biases uh, yeah. that you know all of us carry. Uh, we just need someone to make us aware of yeah. them. Um, mm-hmm. But what we cannot lose as women is our voices in the boardroom, mm-hmm. um, because the boardroom is an opportunity for change. Is an opportunity. Um, for impact is an opportunity to um, to create a, a space for others um, mm. to come on board. Great, awesome! I'm seeing uh, some reactions there, some hand claps that have been been coming through as both uh, Grathel and Glenn, the G and G, have been um, speaking. So, thank you very much. I see uh, from Ayanda there's a comment. It's always great to hear and listen to a conversation about how to succeed and balance a career and life from people who are doing it so well. So they say such a great session and a reminder how powerful discipline and consistency are. 
Thanks, Ayanda. And I see Luke wants to connect with Glenn. I think Glenn Fullerton is on LinkedIn. Grathel as well is on LinkedIn. You can connect with them with them there. And if you'd like to read more from Glenn and Grathel, you can get my book, Masters of Money. Uh, it's on Take A Lot. It's also at Exclusive Books and Bargain Books. Uh, my number is also there. If you want a signed copy, you can connect with me on LinkedIn to get one, or you can drop me a WhatsApp on 072 123 That's 072 123 Thank you, Gibbs, for giving us this opportunity to have this worthwhile conversation. I think Glenn and Grathol, we could have spoken all afternoon. There's so much uh, wisdom mm -hmm. that the both of you have have to share. Mm -hmm. So thanks for having joined this this afternoon, and I look forward uh, to interacting with all of you in different platforms. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, everyone.